Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm calling Arlington's annual town meeting session five to order on Monday, May 9th. Um, let's go ahead and close voting on the attendance check-in. Again, this is only a test vote really, so don't worry if you didn't get your um, attendance check-in vote in. And while those scenes, uh, screens are cycling through, um, uh, watch, I'll hold off my remarks until after the Star Spangled Banner. So let's just uh, sit tight and watch these screens go by. Okay, so can we bring up the, uh, yep. just some brief opening remarks. Um, uh, tonight is Minuteman night, meaning that we'll temporarily skip ahead to Article 55 for the appropriation uh, for the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School. And once that's completed, we'll jump back to Article 16, where we left off last Wednesday to debate regulations on leaf blowers. Uh, on Wednesday of this week, May 11th, we'll open the special town meeting, which has six articles. Special town meeting, if you're not familiar, is embedded within annual town meeting for reasons I'm not gonna explain here, uh, but it's essentially a mini town meeting inside a regular town meeting. Uh, lastly, I wanna discuss the pace of our meetings so far. I added a table to the town meeting progress dashboard to help us understand how debate time translates into the length of town meeting. Uh, can we bring that up briefly, please? And so if you just scroll down under the chart, and so we have a table there, has some yellow rows and some red rows. And um, let's see. So this table shows an approximation modeled on actual timings from our recent meetings of our projected completion date for town meeting, given various scenarios of average speaking time for the remaining articles that are ahead of us. Uh, this predicts that if we spend, this is approximate, of course, so take it with, uh, with a grain of salt. But if we, uh, according to these projections, if we spend 27 minutes debating each of the remaining articles on average, then we're going to run into our hard deadline and, and uh, for the fiscal year, which would be very bad. Uh, our pace from the last two meetings puts us over the deadline and into this red zone. Um, I have some procedural ideas I wanna try and I'll share those ideas ahead of our next meeting on Wednesday. Uh, in, in the meantime, please be mindful of, of how you're using your speaking time, that you're keeping your remarks tight, and, um, and on point and not repeating points that have already been made uh, by previous speakers. Um, 
and I'll have uh, more to uh, to share. Uh, you know, after tonight's meeting, as we go into Wednesday's meeting, we'll, we'll, we'll try something that's a bit new um, and see if I can kind of help us be more informed about where we're at, like the um, uh, uh, a sense of the room of where it's at as far as the debates. And so that's it for my opening remarks. Um, let's um, move on to, let's see. Um, Right, so let's move on to swearing in. Uh, so we're going to skip the swearing in again. If uh, if you're a new town meeting member who has not been sworn in yet, uh, please contact the town clerk and uh, and she'll be able to uh, help you take your oath of office. Uh, I now recognize the chair of the select board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. It is moved that if all business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session. When the town, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns on Wednesday, May 11th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Thank you. Second. Okay. Do, do we have a second? We have a second. Yes, second. Mr. Mr. Foskett. And yes. uh, let's enable raise hands and Zoom. Any objections? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will uh, reconvene. If we do not finish tonight, and we will not finish tonight, we will reconvene uh, on Wednesday, May 11th at 8 p.m. Uh, and now call for reports that are ready to be received. Please note that we'll accept the reports for the special town meeting during the special town meeting this Wednesday. So moderator, move that article three be removed from the table. Okay, do we have any seconds? So. Second. Okay, we have seconds from uh, uh, Ms. Hyam. Thank you. Um, and so uh, any objections? So we have a hand raised, it is now down. So it is uh, no objection. So article three is uh, now before us. We may now receive reports. Do we have any reports from committees? Uh, so uh, we have a hand raised from Ms. Exton. Good evening, Elizabeth Exton, Precinct 13, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. I move acceptance of the school committee report to town meeting. We have a second. Second. Okay, we have a second uh, from Mr. Foskett. Um, and I, any objections and uh, in raise hands and zoom, seeing none. Uh, uh, it's unanimous vote. Uh, Ms. Exton, uh, please proceed with uh, your report. We're going to hold our report until the budget discussion. Okay, very good. Um, anything else, Ms. Exton? That's it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, any uh, raise hands in Zoom? Uh, any other reports um, to be received? Okay, seeing none. Um, Mr. Moderator. Yes, yeah, <coughs> Mr. Foster. that Article Three be laid upon the table. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Uh, raise hands if you object uh, to laying Article Three upon the table. Seeing none, Article Three is now uh, laid upon the table. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Fosco. I move that Article 16 through 54 be laid upon the table. And okay, do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, raised hands if you object to Article 16 to 54 being laid upon the table. Seeing, uh, seeing none, uh, Article 55 is now before the meeting. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Foskett. Um, Mr. Moderator, uh, with your permission, uh, both uh, Michael Rudin and myself would like to make a couple of introductory comments before Dr. Boquillen speaks. Uh, may I proceed on that? You, you may proceed. They have the right to speak. This is Dr. Boquillen's last appearance before the Arlington Town Meeting as superintendent of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School. Since he came to Minuteman in 2007, major changes have taken place. Too many for me to enumerate in full here, but I'd like to mention a few. He revised the academic architecture at Minuteman, greatly improving its quality, its qualitative environment and its quantitative educational results. From our town meetings perspective, he introduced a new era of financial transparency and accountability that ended many years of conflict between the town of Arlington and the Minuteman district. About seven years ago, he organized a group that rewrote the Minuteman charter agreement, updating the agreement that was at that time about 30 or 40 years old eliminating many residual defects that have been holding the institution back for several decades. 
This multi-year effort was fully presented to 16 member towns and unanimously accepted and resulted in a more streamlined and efficient regional district. I think you all know that Dr. Boquillen led the charge to build a new Minuteman Regional High School facility and campus that was built on time and within budget. And this modern Minuteman combined with the innovative academic programs he's attract, he has put in place, he has attracted strong faculty, spurred enrollment, and leaves a vibrant and thriving institution for his successor and all the member communities. Dr. Boquillen is leaving Arlington and the other member towns much better Minuteman school than he was given when he joined the district 15 years ago. For all this, uh, Dr. Boquillen, we thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Foskett. Thank you. I think uh, Mr. Ruderman might want to speak. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ruderman, uh, can we bring up Mr. Ruderman onto the, uh, uh, allow him to speak? Michael Ruderman. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, moderator Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9, and Arlington's representative to the Minuteman School Committee. I, too, add my thanks and my congratul congratulations to Dr. Burquillen. The new school is, is a landmark in, in an administrator's career, and he can take just uh, satisfaction and accolades for completing the project. But it's also something which, which we can share in in the congratulations for because we the member towns according to our participation and our voting for the budget and our paying for the municipal components we made it a reality i think i stood in front of this meeting i think it was six years ago basically telling you trust me vote the money for the new school it will become not only a reality but it will so popularize minuteman's reputation that enrollments will soar, and they have. It has come true. Minuteman enrollments are at an all-time high. And this is something we can all uh, share in some small part of the glory for. The other point that I'd like to make is, is a personal one. For these last two years, being a member of the school committee, I've gotten to see one other aspect of the Minuteman Minuteman superintendent director's success, and that is in the administrative team he has assembled. Every one of them to an individual is, is masterful and dedicated and a pleasure to work with, whether it's in budget, facilities, security, student services, guidance, counseling, all the aspects that typically go unseen, at least they were unseen to me as a, as a parent, as a volunteer, as a member of the General Advisory Board, but having worked with these folks for the last two years now, I wish to commend them and I commend Ed for the team that he has assembled. They are the living part of the legacy, along with the brick and mortar that he leaves to the Minuteman School Di uh, District. I thank him for that, and I wish him all success in his retirement. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ruderman. Um, and we should already have uh, Dr. Bequillen on the panel. Doc Dr. Bequillen, do you want to uh, begin your remarks? Well, I just wanted to thank Charlie and Michael and all of uh, Arlington Town Meeting for those kind words. Um, Arlington is by far the, the most consistent member of the regional district, the most supportive, and, and sometimes the most challenging for a superintendent who's trying to explain what we need to do and how we need to do it. And I've always appreciated um, the questions, the support, and the consistency that Arlington has supported Minuteman and our students. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm just grateful, uh, absolutely grateful for your support. And uh, I look forward to helping the new superintendent uh, acclimate. And one of the things I'll be telling her is the, uh, the proud history that Arlington has as really the strongest supporter of the Minuteman Regional School District. And I think I have a presentation, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> okay, can we bring up, there it is. Okay. So I not, oh, here it is, okay. There we are. Am I in control of this? Let's just see. Or am I, I gonna? Think so. I, th I think you'll have to uh, tell us to advance it. Okay, uh, next please. 
<clears throat> so um so folks from Arlington are texting me, but <laughs> so overall the budget for FY23 is up a little less than 5%, including operating and capital. Next, please. Our objectives are obviously to continue to protect the health and safety of all of our staff and students, continue to advance the Minuteman Academy model. Um, we're trying to increase the enrollment capacity of the facility. Our athletic fields are coming online and we're managing the, the rental revenue and the facilities. And in this fiscal year coming up, we will close out the MSBA project. Next, please. Enrollment growth, uh, next. The story of Miniman is that enrollment has fundamentally shifted. As many of you know, uh, the out of district enrollment for Miniman for decades, has been significant. Um, we are in, seeing a, a fundamental shift away from out of district enrollment <clears throat> and an increase in in district enrollment. Our out of district tuition revenue is decreasing, capital fee is decreasing, and that is resulting in an increase in assessments to member towns. Next, please. This gives you a little picture of what we've seen over the last five years um, the member town enrollment increasing non-member town uh, enrollment decreasing. Next. Our application and enrollment trend as predicted, uh, this past enrollment admissions cycle, we saw over 400 applications, uh, over 300 from our nine member towns. And we still have out of district students applying, although we have no room for them. Um, over 100% increase from the nine member towns since FY19. Next, please. There's a lot going on in this slide, but I'm trying to show the story. Uh, that blue line across the top is the millions of dollars that we've had available to us to offset member town uh, assessments. And, and the uh, line across the bottom is the capital fee revenue. And you can see that line is, is dipping quite drastically. Next. We tried to tell the story of how the uh, four-year rolling average in the new regional agreement is helping some towns in regards to its assessment increases or decreases. For instance, in this slide, Bolton had a 60% increase in enrollment, but the four-year rolling average kept its assessment down to 35% although saying only in 35% in the same sentence is not a good uh, long-term strategy. Next, <clears throat> we see uh, this is where we are at as of last Monday. Uh, we've had in Arlington 97 qualified applicants. We offered admission to over 80. So far, 57 had, have accepted, and there are about 17 on a waiting list. Over 39 students, from all of our member towns are on a waiting list as of this point. We've had to cap the enrollment at this point at 175 for the freshman class because the total enrollment design for the new building is 628. And we're probably gonna be around 710, 715 this fall. Uh, I'm hoping that we can address that as the state uh, revenue becomes clearer but at this point in time, we have a waiting list from our member towns. Next, Arlington enrollment has nearly doubled in the last five years. Next, this is a breakdown of the assessment of almost 7.9 million. Uh, you can see the uh, operating assessments are about 5.8 million. Operating debt and capital is about 400,000. The MSBA debt service, was, which has been excluded, is about 1.7 million in FY23. That's hitting its peak years over the next couple of years. Next. A little bit further breakdown, you'll see the increase in the actual enrollment is about 14, 15%. It pretty much mirrors the four-year rolling in average for Arlington but the assessment is up about 17%. The largest increase in the assessment components is the minimum 
local required contribution, which is set by the state, is up almost 32% next year. Next. Uh, per pupil assessments, obviously, as our operating budgets are modestly increasing, but enrollment is increasing, the per pupil assessment is trending down. Next. Uh, some more specifics in the budget. Next. Uh, we are in the third year of a, of a three-year contract with the teachers, about a 2% increase. Uh, health insurance, as we had predicted, it was going to be increasing. We're getting some pretty good signals that it's not going to increase as much as we anticipated. And other increases that you would expect in supply and materials, um, we're increasing our contribution to the OPEB liability of Minuteman and uh, maintaining a solid contribution to our capital stabilization fund. Next. Uh, these are just some pictures of the facility. Um, you know, I wish sometime we could have them Arlington town meeting in the facility, but next slide, please. Uh, our CTE programs, our animal science program is begun. Uh, we'll be in the second year next year. We're expanding engineering and robotics into logistics engineering. Um, we're also providing uh, workplace lab clothing and safety gear for all students and student credentialing costs will be um, supported by the district budget. We were finding that some students were unable to pay for the costs of credentialing. We really believe it's an equity issue that we make sure that every student who's eligible for an industry recognized credential is able to complete, uh, participate and achieve that credential. Next. <clears throat> oh, there you see some of our programs, animal science. Next slide, please. Uh, our robotics engineering, we've gotten some great grants for some uh, pretty heavy duty industrial robotics equipment. Next. Staffing additions for FY23, um, additional support for students in the form of adjustment counselors, uh, school psychologists. We still have about 47% of our students are on IEPs. Uh, we're adding back a programming and web teacher that has been a one teacher department for several years. Uh, robotics and automation, HR support, and slowly bringing back the library reading aid. Next slide, please. We haven't had any active reductions, but these are some positions that are not being refilled. So our net increase at this point in time is only 1.5 FTE. Next. Um, some pictures. Next. So we're trying to expand the enrollment beyond our design enrollment. We're basically doing that without increasing any debt. We're using our capital stabilization fund account, and we're also leveraging some strategic business partnerships and our ability to enter into long-term ground leases. These projects are underway now. Uh, we're expanding the metal fab shop on the north end of the building. This will allow us to increase uh, another 32 students over four years. And we're um, in the design phase now of an animal health and wellness center, which we are partnering with the Boston Veterinary Clinic, who would be opening a, a live available public vet clinic that our students will be working in, in a building that already exists on campus, which was utilized years ago for a daycare center by MIT and most recently was uh, home for an independent day school. Um, that will increase our capacity by at least 60 students, if not more. Next, OPEB liability. Um, the good news is it's decreased uh, from two years ago from 32 million to 26 million. Next, the school committee has adopted an OPEB study group recommendations where we're increasing significantly our funding of our OPEB trust fund as our ESCO lease comes off of the balance sheet. We're also adding $10,000 per, 
per year in the budget for every new position created to fund our OPEB liability. Next. That concludes my uh, presentation. Great, thank you, Dr. Bequillen. And uh, I, I also wanna thank you for your years of service. I, I've actually never known a town meeting without your presentation from them. So, uh, um, so let, let's open it now to the uh, speaking queue. And um, I, I'm actually gonna go out of order this time. We haven't heard much from Ms. Hyam this town meeting. So let's pull her up first. Hello, um, Liba Hyam, Precinct 15. And um, first, I want to I want to point out some accolades, Dr. McCullough. It is nice to see um, Minuteman returning to the vocational mission by having the industry credentialing in the vet clinic. Um, I did want to ask, what is the breakdown of the number of students that are entering vocational programs with the intent of going directly into industry after high school versus the percent that are going towards colleges? Hmm. That's a great question. And I, uh, when they enter Minuteman, I think probably more than half of the students feel like they're going to go directly to work and not go to college. But what ends up happening over four years is they begin to see what it is they do well and love to do and they get uh, more awareness of particular occupational opportunities and what additional education might provide them in terms of a career. So overall, the last five years or so, about 60 to 65 percent of our graduates have gone on to post-secondary training of some sort. Between 30 and 35 percent go directly into work from Minuteman. And um of the students who are waitlisted, um, is that breakdown similar in terms of their area of interest or is there any disproportion among um, the, the programs offered? Well, a student goes on a waitlist based upon where they fall in the process, not, it doesn't have anything to do with what their choices may be. Um, I don't know, but it's pretty much across the board. Um, I don't have any data from the last couple of weeks around the wait list itself. And, and I think this will be an issue for your um, successor because I, I'm not sure if you remember me from last year, but um, I did have concerns that the students that are most interested in a vocational um, pathway might be the ones that are least successful in a traditional learning environment at the middle school level, and therefore do not rank as high on the um, Minuteman criteria, entrance criteria. And so I really would encourage you to start um, doing some program specific analysis for students entering Minuteman. Um, and that certainly you know, would, would help me um, as a town meeting member in terms of recognizing the needs for increases in the budget. So like the need for industry credentialing, that is a really, really clear reason for us to be giving Minuteman more money because that will help our vocational students with their careers. Other things, it's, it's not as clear a, um, a direction. And I wanna thank you for your time and wish you luck in the next phase of your life. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Foskett next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Um, Dr. Boquillen, uh, in the past, uh, you have told us about a program you had to reclaim the sports fields at Minuteman and with the lighting and some other um, uh, attributes there. Could you explain the status of that, where we are? Is it, is it completed? And uh, how much did it cost? Yeah, thanks. Um, we use some of the remaining funds in our MSBA project to put towards new athletic fields. The athletic fields are located where the old building was. Um, we expect that all the fields will be fully open to the public, if, if you will, in the next three weeks or so. Um, we have enjoyed uh, an opening day 
on all three fields this spring. We did use the field, the major field last fall for a few football games. So in the next few weeks, it will be fully operational and available for um, Minuteman use, as well as the use by some of our member communities. In addition, Charlie, we also had the, uh, the Arlington Youth Theater Group was uh, using our new theater this last weekend, or weekend before last. So the facilities are coming online and are available. Thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Jameson next. Name and precinct. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, I too would like to echo the wonderful job that the superintendent has done. And I'm saddened that we are not in town hall so we could give him an expected uh, standing ovation as he goes into retirement. Um, I would uh, just echo Ms. Hyams' uh, comments about the wait list. And that was a concern last year by the meeting. And uh, again, I see that we are high up there. Obviously we have a large number of students. Um, could you uh, elaborate a bit more on, on the state um, required minimum contribution? Was it the same percentage last year or has that changed? I think the well, the percentage is changes every year when it comes to how the state makes that calculation that each of our member towns are required to contribute to Minuteman. It's part of the cherry sheet that you may have heard of that comes out in the spring. Um, it's based upon the valuation of property around your ability to pay and your historical contribution to education. Um, so is it is it is is that percentage up from last year for Arlington? It's up slightly as a percentage of the total because of the enrollment changes over the last few years. Okay, thank you. And one more um, quick question on the um, on this uh, on the career technical programs, where you mentioned that it says here our credentialing costs are off of grants and to district budget. Does that mean previously um, to inter try to interpret what your presentation? that um, you, you provided on a selective basis grants to students that needed um, their credentialing costs covered, but now you're just making sure that the district bu budget covers that? Is, that. is that what you said? Yeah, uh, what we're trying to do, grants can change from year to year. And so we may not have as many resources available to make sure that all students are being supported in their uh, request for credentials. So by putting it into the district budget, it, it makes it more, um, you know, consistent. Is that a large number? No, it's, it's probably, I would say total $25,000 total. Okay. Thank you. But Thank first, you very much. And congratulations on the retirement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take uh, Ms. Phelan next. Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michelle Phelan, Precinct 4. And um, thank you, Mr. Cohen, for all you've done on behalf of Minuteman and adding programming and student enrollment. It's all pretty wonderful. I had a chance to see the campus when it first opened, and I was, I was so amazingly impressed. The one thing I wanted to ask about was the difference between qualified applicants and those offered admission. And I know in some cases the number, the qualified applicant number matches that of those offered admission. For example, I think Bolton was one example of qualified applicants was 12 and those offered admission was 12. But in others, you know, for Lexington, for example, 37 were qualified and 30 were offered admission. And obviously Arlington fell into the 97 qualified, 80 offered admission. I remember a conversation happening at last town meeting where there was some discussion about the process with which applicants were uh, offered admission. And I wanted to know if the process has changed at all, if there have been any updates to that process, and if you could just give us a quick update on, on that um, procedure. Thank you. Sure. You may recall last year was a kind of a strange year because the Department of Education was requiring admissions policies change. And we were in the, but they didn't, 
ask us to do that until we had already started our admissions process for last year. So one of the things that has changed in the terms of the what the word qualified means, all that really means is that the student's application was complete. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, they'd filled out the form, the parents had signed it, and all of the information that we needed from the sending school was received. That's what the word qualified means. So, and the differences, the deltas between qualified and offered really has to do with the slot allocation formula, which has really not changed. And that's based upon the formula that's in the regional agreement that allocates capital costs across the nine member towns. So in the, in the case of Arlington, where there had many more applicants than we had slots in other towns, there were fewer applicants from that particular town. So we were able to offer more students in Arlington admissions based upon just the give and take the uh, up and down of enrollment and applications from each of the nine member towns. Does that help? That helps a little bit, but it sounds like the process is not scientific or not mathematical and it might be a little bit sort of, as you mentioned, give and take. Um, and I, I just wanna be sure that as a, as a town that has provided funding and, and supported from day one, the school that as many applicants as possible that qualified and were offered admission are also given the opportunity to accept an offer. Yeah, I don't know what you mean by mathematical and stuff. With the Department of Ed had, uh, we, our process, if I was to describe it in one phrase or from previous years to this year that we're in is it's much more open. <clears throat> in other words, more students have the opportunity to become qualified applicants than ever before. And that's a good thing. And that's going to continue. What we are experiencing, as you see from the chart that I gave you, over 400 applications, mm -hmm. for 175 spots, 100% um, increase from our nine member towns. This is unprecedented. Um, and um, I'm hopeful we're able to accommodate all of the kids who want to come from our nine member towns. But um, at this point, it's just, uh, it's, it's a process. Well, thank you very much. For, I appreciate your addressing thank it. Thank you for your kind words. All right, thank you. Let's uh, take Mr. Rudiman next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. One of the things that the uh, Minuteman School Committee has been working on throughout this year is putting into effect a plan to increase overall enrollment uh, with a target number of 800 students annually. A lot of that depends upon what uh, the Commonwealth comes through with, with the budget, as uh, Dr. B alluded to the, um, you know, previously. Uh, that'll have a lot to do with our final um, you know, capability of hiring faculty. We are putting more bricks and mortar together to expand uh, the classroom space because that's the, that's the pinch point uh, right now in our capacity. We, have, we almost have enough shop space for, for uh, what we would estimate to be the, the shop requirements for an 800 student school. We're adding classrooms. The program in veterinary science is brand new and Boston Veterinary Clinic will be our partner in that. If you've ever adopted an animal from the Animal Rescue League of Boston, Boston Veterinary Cl Clinic is just on the other side of the building. So they are the in-house and public facing clinic of, of, of ARL. Um, they are on the front lines of veterinary science in, in America. Um, so we're headed there and uh, we hope to get to 800 students annually in a few years. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, I see some, looks like ghosts of past speakers on the speaker queue. So we've exhausted the speaker queue. So I believe we are ready for um, a vote. Uh, so let us enable voting. And while we bring that up, uh, vote yes if you are in favor of appropriating seven, roughly $7.9 million to pay the town's share of costs 
of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School District budget. If you're in favor of appropriating $7.9 million roughly um, for that, you want to vote yes. If you uh, are not in favor of appropriating roughly $7.9 million for that budget, then you would vote no. Let's try to get our votes in as quickly as we can. We should have the uh, the wave, the, the automated wave voting enabled. Remember, so it'll cycle through. If you were in one of the later waves now, you'll be cycled through to the earlier waves or the middle wave uh, in the subsequent votes that we take on future articles. Um, so everyone gets a fair shot of voting early versus voting, voting in the middle versus voting late. Um, and votes are coming in pretty quickly. It's good to see. So vote yes, again, if you are in favor of appropriating uh, roughly $7.9 million to pay the town's share of costs of the Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School District budget. And vote no if you are not in favor of that appropriation. And again, if you're having trouble voting through the portal, you can vote in the uh, in the uh, Q and A, and you could also ask for uh, technical support um, with the Get Help button on the left side of your portal window. You could also you could also call um, Julie Brazil, town clerk. Can we get those instructions? Do we have those instructions up in the chat? Okay, it sounds like we're we're, we're getting calls coming in, so we'll, we'll hold off on. We won't, we won't close voting quite yet. Folks can uh, also vote uh, in the Q and A. Okay, so we let's, uh, let's okay. So let's just wait another ten seconds. Um, almost all the votes are in, so just um, it's five seconds, and then we'll close voting. That's nearly everybody. Okay, let's go ahead and close voting. And this this is a uh, majority vote that we need. And it passes. It is unanimous vote. Um, 235 in the affirmative, zero in, um, in the negative, and two abstentions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, Arlington. Um, right. Love you all. Take care. Right. Thank you, Dr. McQuillan. And um, congratulations, town meeting members. You spent nearly $8 million just now. Um, Moderator? Yes, uh, Mr. Foskett. Um, I move that Article 16 through 54 be removed from the table. Do we have a second? Second. Can we have a second? Uh, with raised hands and Zoom, um, are there any, any objections to uh, removing Articles uh, 16 through 54 from the table? Seeing none, Article 16 is now once again before us. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier. I will call for uh, announcements and resolutions after uh, we take our break, roughly around 9.30, roughly the halfway point of the meeting. Uh, so in case you were wondering about when we were going to have announcements and resolutions, that will be just after the break. We decided to do that so that we can get uh, the Minuteman vote uh, done as, as early as possible um, for scheduling reasons. Um, Okay, so let's now go back to Article 16. We have the speaker queue here, which has been uh, uh, brought back up. And let's see. So before we get into debate, because uh, where we left off last Wednesday was we had uh, quickly run through the amendments and uh, there were several of them. 
uh, we actually have one more amendment. So let us discuss that first, and then we'll have an overview so we could see uh, all in one picture, all of the amendments before us, because this is a pretty confusing article given the number of amendments we have, and some of them do interact in subtle ways. Uh, so we will step through all that. And uh, so, um, Mr. Diggins, uh, do you want to um, introduce your um, your amendment and uh, and offer a motion? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mr. Moderator. And uh, so, so I, I am making a motion to amend Article 16, and it's really just a little technical fix to make um, explicit what I think to some of us was a little bit unclear. And that is what happens after the, um, the, the transition period. So essentially after the transition period, when we are only using electric um, leaf blowers, the hours of operation, um, permitted operation will be Monday through Friday, um, 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Saturday, Sundays and legal holidays from 8 a.m. Um, to 4 p.m. And that will be for all, all users. So that's it, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Okay, uh, so do you care to, um um uh, move to amend article 16 with your submitted uh amendment yes mr moderator that's what i'd like to do okay uh do we have a second second uh, we have a second uh by mr foskett and uh okay so we now have a fifth amendment uh on article 16. Uh, actually, actually I mean, any objections uh uh with raised hands in zoom before we actually take that Seeing no objections, uh, we now have our uh, our Fifth Amendment. So can we now bring up on the display the unified view that we've cobbled together of all of the amendments uh, superimposed over the, the, the main motion of Article 16? Um, so I'll, I'll read through these instructions. This, this is uh, attached to the annotated warrant online. If you want to read through the instructions, I'll just very briefly say, um, because it's hard to do strike through with colored lines on different colored text. Uh, we're using, just using the special syntax of like these angle brackets around text that's to be stricken. Um, and then any colored text like the plus new text here uh, would be added. Uh, usually that would be underlined, but we're just using colors here because we have multiple different uh, amendments that we're trying to show in the same view for context. Um, and then if there's any renumbering of items, we're just going to call that out in a comment because it gets really messy if you try to fix that up with multiple amendments, changing different things in the same view. OK, so the color coding here is we have the Goodwin Amendment 1 in red, Goodwin Amendment 2 in green, Friedman Amendment in blue, the Brown Amendment in orange, um, and the Diggins Amendment in purple. So let's just uh, slowly scroll through this and we'll uh, just so you can see everything in context in one, in one place. Um, so we can skip through any of the, the text that's just the, the straight up black text. Um, so when we get to the colored text, like the, yeah, so the red text here we're seeing is the Goodwin One Amendment. And that makes a number of changes throughout. That's probably the most complex of the amendments. Uh, it changes the date at the top. It strikes out June 15th and inserts May 31st. Um, it brings the transition period up into two subsection A, like into the title of that section, out from the, you know, uh, the body of that section. Um, and it also adds, Goodwin 1 also adds the only between the calendar dates of March 15th uh, to May 31st and September 15th to December 30th. Uh, then we have in orange, we have the Brown Amendment. I guess I, I should have made that color brown. That would have been easier. But um, And so the Brown Amendment in orange strikes the Saturday, um, uh, the, the Saturday's allowance uh, so that uh, leaf blowers are uh, during the transition period uh, for commercial and municipal users, uh, Saturdays are disallowed um, implicitly because they will not be in the allow list uh, uh, of this section. And, and then you can see in, uh, in Roman numeral lowercase three, and under 2A, use is prohibited on Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. So it's adding Saturdays to the list of prohibitions on uh, commercial um, leaf blower usage uh, and municipal leaf blower usage. And similarly, for electric powered leaf blowers, uh, there's the, uh, it, uh, the Brown Amendment in orange also strikes Saturdays from that 
uh, the set of allowed times. So it effectively be prohibited on, prohibited on Saturdays as well. And then we'll go down and see like in green of an acre or more is the Goodwin II Amendment. Um, and that, I, I believe that's all there is to, um, to good, uh, the Goodwin, II amend or good, good, Goodwin Amendment 2. Uh, and then we have more of the red text, which is back to the Goodwin 1, uh, where it's making similar changes that were made up above, but this now is the section for resident users transition period as opposed to up above. It was the, um, uh, let's see, it was the uh, commercial and municipal users. Right? And, and then we see, this is probably where the interaction between the amendments is the most nuanced. Uh, you'll see that the red the, the red edits overlap with the blue edits, and the blue edits are uh, the Friedman Amendment. Um, so these actually, uh, if you see, if you can highlight the Roman numeral I there that has the red and blue strike throughs around it, or the virtual strike throughs. Yeah. So both Goodwin one and the Friedman Amendment both strike this line, but they strike it with different intentions. And, it's in, and you can see that based on the context, because in the, in the red Goodwin one, that, striked out, that stricken out text um, ends up being hoisted up to the previous paragraph. So it's just moving it around. Whereas in Friedman Amendment, uh, that Roman numeral I is stricken and not placed back in. So it's just wiped out. And so that's the difference, even though they're striking out the same line, contextually, they're, some, they're, they're doing semantically different things with that strikeout. And that's kind of confusing. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it procedurally, because we have, to order, we, have, we have to vote on these amendments in a particular order, and the order in which we vote on them can change the interaction between them. So we'll, we'll step through that at the time. Um, and then if you scroll down, even further, you'll get to some purple text. And this is uh, the Diggins Amendment. It just adds a, an item G, which makes explicit the post-transition uh, regulation on electric leaf blowers, because that was left implicit in the main motion. And this just makes it explicit what happens after the transition period is over. Um, so that was just a really fast overview of all the different amendments in context. Hopefully that was useful. This document, again, you might want to view this and kind of pour over it and use it for reference as we're having these, uh, this debate. Uh, you can pull this off of the, the annotated warrant online. Um, let's see. And we have two points of order. Uh, so let's take those first before we dive into debate. Let's take up uh, uh, Ms. Friedman first. Um, uh, name and precinct and um, tell us your point of order. Beth Ann Friedman, precinct 15. Um, in the past, the speaking list was always carried over from the previous meeting. And I see I was six on the speaking list as of um, last Wednesday. I'm no longer on it. Hmm. So is that a change in policy on your part? It's not a change in policy. It, it sounds like it, it may be an error. Uh, I know last week we had an issue with folks who dropped off the speaker queue, but then there was confusion about what to do about that. And I want to avoid going forward, um, um, modifying the speaker queue like beyond what the system has set up. So uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, we'll see if we can find, like maybe someone, um, uh, let's see, someone has a screenshot uh, that they, uh, they mentioned in the Q&A. Um, can someone from maybe uh, 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 IT or someone on the panel uh, see if you can get a uh, that's a, a screenshot to see what the state was and how it might differ from what we have here? Um, and if anyone on the panel has any ideas of what might have happened, uh, I'm all ears. Um, so why don't we proceed with debate while well, hopefully folks can try to investigate what may have happened there. And if we, if we do have a screenshot that someone took of the speaking queue, see if we can try to reconstruct if it, if it doesn't match what we see here. And I don't know if it's possible that if, if buttons were accidentally pushed that might've removed a request to speak, um, I'm not sure. So, um, but we'll, we'll do the best that we can, especially if we have some like screenshot evidence, we'll, we'll, we'll try to respect that if we can. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, we, we have someone on the panel who does have a screenshot. Um, and so they're, they're gonna they're gonna just check that out and see what's happening. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Bloom's point of order next. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Um, just a question. Uh, Mr. Diggins' um, amendment, which was just put in recently, uh, includes Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. And I believe the Brown Amendment wished to discontinue Saturdays. And of course, that was put in before the Diggins Amendment. So I was wondering how that interplays with the post position stuff. Yeah, so that would be a question for debate that we can bring up. Um, but it doesn't really rise to a point of order because it's not really procedural about, I mean, if there is an error or an inconsistency in the text of the amendments, um, that, that's uh, something we could address during debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, also, before we get to the speaking to you, I actually did want to, um, uh, Mr. Heim, uh, can you speak to, there was a discrepancy about dates that a number of folks had noticed. Um, can you tell us uh, what we had discussed earlier about the dates and the um, the intention of the select board. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, this is all born of the best intentions. Uh, early on, we had a discussion about an administrative correction uh, that was not actually a necessary administrative correction. I'm gonna to try to keep this as simple as I can. The select board's vote clearly evidenced an intent for resident users during the transition period to have an extra year than commercial uh, or municipal uh, users of leaf blowers. So any place under the sub paragraph uh, C, 2C in the vote, resident users transition period should read May 31st, 2022 through March 15th, 2026. And the same thing um, should be in resident user phase out paragraph 2D as of March 15th, 2026 is what it should say. So um, the timeline, just to be very clear for resident users is supposed to be an additional year to make the transition from gas powered to electric. So it should be 2026 in all places relative to resident user transition. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Heim. So I've made those corrections already in my unified doc because I talked to Mr. Heim ahead of time about this. Um, uh, Ms. Brazil, can you confirm that that's also updated on the, uh, I believe that's, can, can you confirm the status of the text in the annotated uh, warrant online? Yes, the annotated warrant currently mirrors in sections C and D um, of the resident uh, periods the uh, select board text because Goodwin Amendment 1 um, fixes the confusion in C and brings them, makes it consistent. Right, so yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that we will rely on, we will attempt to correct that with Goodwin Amendment 1, if it, should it pass. And if, good, but if Goodman, Goodwin Amendment 1 fails, then we'll go ahead and uh, make an administrative change to correct it what it should be, um, correct? Yes, I believe that's the plan. Otherwise, yeah, because the wrinkle there procedurally is if we if we correct it administratively now before we vote on the Goodwin One Amendment, then um, it interferes with the baseline in the diff for Goodwin One, and then we have to amend the amendment. And I'd rather we just kind of not do that. And so we'll see if Goodwin One Amendment can fix this. And if it, if it doesn't, if it fails, then we'll take an administrative change. Um, and that should reduce the complexity of um, getting us to where we need to be with these corrections. Um, okay, so let's, um, let me just check back in on the status of the speaking queue. Um, uh, okay, so if someone who is investing, investigating this can tell me where uh, Ms. Ms. Friedman or others, oh, they're still working on it. Okay, so they'll report back to me at some point. So hopefully we get that corrected by the time we get to the 
positions in the speaking queue that uh, we get to the affected folks. And since we have screenshots uh, from last week, um, hopefully we can reconstruct not just from Ms. Friedman, but anyone else who had inadvertently dropped off the queue. And apologies for any kind of uh, technical um, malfunctions there. Um, okay, so let's now, uh, without further ado, go to the speaking queue. Let's take uh, Mr. White in the number one position. Uh, name and precinct, please. Okay, I was from before. I just um, discontinue this because I presented oh, okay. a motion. Okay, yeah, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so we're still just, okay. Um, and I, did you finish, uh, I think you had completed your in introduction. Is that correct? Yes, I can finish, yes. Okay. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, let's, um, let's take uh, Mr. Tremblay next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Let's see. Mr. Trevely, are you able to unmute if you can hear me? There you go. There's the button. There it is. Yep, we can hear you. All right. Um, name and precinct? Ed Trembley, precinct 19. You know, way back in the dark ages, in the last century, I used to work for an electric car company. And at the time, there was a move afoot to require the use of electric cars. Um, thankfully, I, I will give you some latitude on this, but we are, we are talking about leaf blowers, but. No, I understand that. Yeah, yeah, Let, let's try to keep it tight. Go ahead. Thankfully, that didn't go anywhere because uh, electric cars back then were not ready for prime time. In the, uh, you know, I've been doing a little looking at leaf blowers, and uh, I would say that right now, leaf blowers are further along that timeline, but they still aren't really quite there yet. Uh, the commercial leaf blowers that I've I've been able to commercial battery powered leaf blowers that I've been able to scare up specifically of the backpack version, which is what landscapers tend to use. Um, seem to be able to move, uh, do about half the air that the gas engine ones do. And they cost more money right now. And the batteries don't last all that long. And the batteries are very expensive. So where, where a, a good commercial Red Max leaf blower, I think could be had for uh, around $1,100, a I think it was a Husqvarna I looked up today. Uh, we'll do about half of what the of what the Red Max will do, and it costs a couple three hundred dollars more. And that's not including the batteries that, if you want to make it through the day, you'll need several of, which I understand cost six seven hundred bucks. So we're actually now looking at doubling or tripling the cost of equipment for commercial landscapers and and this you know homeowners this is the uh homeowners you're asking them to to stop using their leaf blowers in uh, i think it was four years well somebody takes halfway decent care of their leaf blower they could last a lot longer than that uh, so I, I, I get rather uncomfortable about uh, about government uh, and, and we are a government town meeting um, requiring people to stop using something that they have that works just fine and there's nothing wrong with it. In in the case of electric cars, as we as we now see here, uh, 20, uh, 22, 25 years later, electric cars have progressed uh, quite a bit so that they are now a practical means of transportation, although they are still expensive and the batteries are still expensive. And, but they have, they are a lot more practical now than they were when I was working on electric cars. And I presume the same thing will happen with leaf blowers. So if you, anytime you stand on Mass Ave, you'll see that electric cars are becoming more and more prevalent and I think that would be the case with lease blowers. 
I think this this uh, regulation is completely unnecessary because when electric leaf blowers are able to hold their own and actually become better than the gas engine ones, then everybody will adopt them. They'll go out and get electric ones if they're uh, if, and, and use them instead of the gas engine leaf blowers. So I would suggest that we vote no on this. Let um, progress take take its uh, uh, let progress take its uh, its natural course, and don't try to force something on the public that's not quite ready for prime time. Now I understand that there are people are very concerned about uh, global warming and all that. So if I may suggest, uh, they could contact their, their, uh, oh, I'm going to just call that because we're not, I mean, the main thrust here is not about the, uh, this is not under the, uh, environmental uh, regulation. This is about noise abatement. That's the context of the, the Warren article. Right? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I would then uh, modify that the, what I was about to say just a little bit. And for those people who are really concerned about the noise, you could ask your landscaper to sweep your sidewalk or use rakes and, and just let him know that you would be more than happy to spend the extra money that it will cost you to get your lawn done in order to, uh, to have a little more peace and quiet around your house. Um, so I would suggest that we not vote for this and like i said let let uh progress proceed in in its natural pace thank you very much Ms. moderator thank you let's take ms muldoon next thank you mr moderator patty muldoon precinct 20. i'm speaking in support uh, you uh ms muldoon you just muted it looks like Okay, try again. I can hear you now, yeah. Thank you. Patty Muldoon, Precinct 20. I'm speaking in support of both the article, well, and the Goodwin 1 and Goodwin 2 amendments. The other amendments um, I'm confused by, but I'm very clear on these issues. As a homeowner who has used an electric leaf blower for years, and also as a neighbor uh, of those who are not using electric, so I have no control over the very loud leaf blowers that um, one of my neighbors uses. So I happened to pick up when I went sorry, to the uh, gym. Ms. Muldoon, uh, just hold on yeah. one second. I apologize sure. for the interruption. Um, because uh, I wasn't getting a response in the chat here. Can, can we just start the, uh, the timer? Because we don't have the place. I don't see the timer going. Great, thank you. Sorry, Ms. Muldoon, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. So I happened to be going to the gym and, and this issue of 50 plus advocate I picked up, noise pollution is more than an inconvenience. The May issue, just addressing the dangers to our health of the noise pollution of gas leaf blowers. And the level, the decibel level is so high that the World Health Organization has come out against it. So it's a challenge for residents using them. It's a challenge for neighbors. And even more intensely, it's a challenge for the workers who are doing this for commercial landscapers and spend hours uh, with the potential and likely damage to their hearing. But this article points out that it caused the noise levels cause distress and stress and headaches. It can affect our ability to fall asleep. And um, it can even cause an increase in depression or anxiety that noise annoyance, annoyance is a psychological condition. I'm reading this from this article, which has got lots of references I'm not gonna go into. So I will say that on the health issues, the the danger from gas-powered leaf blowers is pretty intense. 
And I also wanted to speak to the environmental issues that uh, the climate crisis that we are in right now is directly affected by our purchases as well as that of the commercial um, landscapers that are all around us because it's worse than our gas powered cars. Right. So, I, I, so I just want to interrupt to say, I mean, as I yeah. told Mr. Tremblay, I do want to keep this focused on the noise abatement aspect since, I mean, I can give a little bit of latitude, but uh, uh, I do want, want to keep it focused on the, uh, the, the scope of the article, which is about the noise abatement. Thank you. Well, as speaking as a homeowner who's used an electric leaf blower for years, the equipment's even better now. So I feel very appreciative of this version with its uh, at least its first two amendments, um, with the gradual time transitions that are offered, not requiring people to buy new equipment. And I would also like to note that we have heard from um, the owner of Eco Quiet Lawn Care in Concord, who has noted that he's been using electric leaf blowers for eight years out in Concord and um, Lincoln, uh, where they have up to six acres of lawn and has been very successful, not had any problems with using their electric equipment. We've heard from other commercial landscapers who've had the same experience. And I would also like to point out that more than 100 US cities and towns have banned or limited the use of gas powered leaf blowers, including our neighbors. Lexington, Cambridge, Brookline, Marblehead, and right now Belmont and Winchester are in the same process that we are on of banning or limiting use. So it's viable right now. The equipment is not uh, more expensive as presented by the original uh, presentation that we heard at the last town meeting. And now is the time. we. Forgive me, but we must address not only our health, but the health of the world. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, let's take Mr. Kerbel next. Can you hear me now? Yes, name and precinct, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is Joe Kerbel, Precinct 13. I would like to give my time to Gary Tibbetts. He's a former town meeting member and a longtime Arlington resident. He's purchased these electric blowers for his business, and he can speak to that. Gary is also... Uh, Mr. Kerbal, you, your your microphone appears to be muted now. Oh, hello. Yeah, I just shut off on its own. I'm sorry. There you are. Yeah. I'm not sure how much you got. So Gary's actually purchased these electric blowers for his business, so he can speak to that. But Gary's also just recently moved from Arlington, so I guess I have to ask town meeting to vote to vote to let him speak. Permission? Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so. Um, let's see. So uh, Mr. Tibbetts is, is not is no longer a resident of uh of arlington correct right he just moved out of arlington yep okay so and and you have uh, uh so do we do we have a second we look we have a second from ms brazil um and so uh, if there are any objections to allowing mr tibbetts to speak raise your hand in zoom any objections is raise hands enabled So I'll give maybe 15 seconds. I can see that, I don't know if, partic if attendees can see it, but I can see the count on uh, raised hands. Okay, 15 seconds is up and we have uh, four raised, one, two, three, five raised hands. Uh, so uh, it's not enough objections. So I consider that a majority vote uh, to allow Mr. Tibbetts to speak. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Tibbetts, uh, name and... Uh, um uh, address i suppose hi can you hear me yes i can hi my name is gary tibbetts um and thanks for letting me talk i was born and raised in arlington my wife and i raised our kids in arlington and i've started and operated tibbetts landscape in arlington for over 40 years and i care about what happens in arlington I'd like to start out by saying I'm not against changing to electric leaf blowers. It's coming. It's just not here yet. The problem is the research and the development of these machines. 
the, the research money follows the dollar. So Tesla and GM, Ford and Honda are concentrating their efforts on making batteries and charging systems for $55 and $60,000 cars, not $900 leaf blowers. And as far as the small engine manufacturers go, like Honda, DeWalt, Makita, Stahl, their, their efforts are going in the homeowner market where they might sell 20 million units instead of a million units to commercial landscapers. Myself and my company have already switched to electric sanding units on our trucks in the winter time and have found it a very good way of doing it. We've, we, I've also purchased several units to try out. I've used them around my own house. And some of the more expensive ones do have power, not near what the gas ones do. But the biggest issue is the battery and the charging time. The battery run time is around 35 to 45 minutes, even though it's advertised at higher than that. And it takes several hours to recharge them. And, you know, we're working out of trucks. We have no way of charging them. So we'd probably have to carry six or seven batteries in a truck for a crew each day. And it, it, it would still take longer. And the batteries tend to go stupid after a sh short amount of time. I'm sure everybody has had a cordless vacuum, a cordless drill that they didn't use a lot and they charged when they were getting ready to use it. And they found, you know, the battery after a while, instead of holding a charge for, you know, a half hour of vacuum in three or four rooms, would only vacuum one room. So that, that makes it a, a big problem. The, uh, the other, um, thing I want to bring up is, is, as most everybody knows, the labor in this business is predominantly Latino. And a lot of these companies now are owned by Latinos or managed by Latinos. The other day I was at one of the supply yards that we all go to and a few of the Latino guys yelled over to me. He said, hey, Tibbetts, you're from Arlington. I said, yeah, I am. He says, what's going on with the people from Arlington? For the last couple of years, I mean, stayed in their houses nice and safe. Yeah, Mr. Tibbetts, let, let me just uh, interject for a second. Let, let's keep this within scope. Um, it, it, it is within scope. Okay. I'm talking about the people that it's going to affect. Okay, but the specific in the context of uh, like mainly around the, the noise abatement, which is what this is uh, under, the, the article is under. Um, well, okay. Yeah, so if you can pull it into that. Uh, yeah. Well, like, it, it, you know, the, the people that are using them don't mind using them and they're using the proper air protection and everything. And it, it's not, if, if you're using the right equipment and the right protection, they don't pre present a problem. But, you know, the, the other issue, you know, just to bring up is as far as cost. You know, a lot of you that have lawn services and I actually, when I was on town meeting, I picked up several customers, including a couple of selectmen as customers. So you've probably noticed on your lawn bills that over the last eight or 10 years, we all switched to billing by the hour for the spring and fall cleanups. And um, so in East Arlington, the average small yard, we usually put three guys on a cleanup crew. It takes them a couple hours to clean the house. Usually, you know, they'll get four yards done with the current equipment that we're using. With this new equipment, we've tried it out and I don't see how we could get more than three yards done. If that, we'd be pushing it. We're still going to bill three men for eight hours for 24 hours. The company's not going to get hurt by it, but the bill is going to be split up between three houses instead of four. And the other problem comes in at where we, where we are right now with help. We can't add another crew or, a, or a two crews. You know, in my case, I run about nine crews a day. Uh, so, Mr. We, we do have to wrap up. We have about, uh, about 15 seconds left of Mr. Kerber's right. time. Well, okay. if they, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing is we went through this before in the major portion of the town did not want this. They, we had the largest turnout ever for an election. And then that was after a hurricane the night before. And, you know, the, the majority of Arlington people wanted to keep using these. And, and I'm not saying we can't change the electric. It's just not right now. It's just not doable. Okay, well, we're at time, we're over time. Um, okay. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Tibbetts. All right, thanks th for your thank time. You.
Thank you, Mr. Kerbel. And just just one yes. note um, uh, about scope. Um, so obviously, I, I reiterated a number of times now that like we want to focus on the the uh, noise abatement aspect of this article. But what is relevant to the scope is any um, impact that a transition from gas powered leaf blowers to electric leaf blowers might have. Um, so if, if you're talking about those impacts, that, that, that can be within scope. It's not just about noise, but um, yeah, the context of the effectiveness, the efficacy, feasibility, viability of a transition to electric leaf blowers is within scope. Uh, so let's take uh, Ms. Farrell next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Ms. Farrell, are you able to unmute on your side? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, name and precinct, please. Okay, sorry for the delay. Catherine oh. Farrell, Precinct 5. Uh, one of the many reasons why I support Article 16 is that it will eliminate the air and noise pollution caused by gas-powered leaf blowers. The air pollution includes high levels of formaldehyde, benzene, fine particulate matter, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. This air pollution endangers the health of the landscaping workers using the machines and the residents in the area. In contrast, electric mowers have zero emissions, which will be a big improvement for the health of the workers and residents. I was going to speak more on the noise sorry, pollution, sorry, but sorry. I won't. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Farrell, uh, we are trying to keep it to the scope of the noise abatement and any kind of implications or consequences of a transition to electric. Okay. Uh, I am not going to go into the noise because I think Patty Muldoon just covered that uh, fine and I echo her comments. So in conclusion, I'm urging all of you to join me and vote in favor of Article 16. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll take, uh, actually, let's take uh, Mr. Uh, Kepline's point of order, and we're almost at the halfway point in the meeting. So uh, let's take Mr. Kepline's uh, point of order first. Uh, name and precinct, please. Uh, Mark Kepline, precinct nine. Mr. Moderator, you're showing your bias. You, she was able to ramble on about air pollution. You didn't cut her off right away. I disagree. So, and, um, and, that is not a point of order as far as the like the actual procedures of the meeting. Uh, so um, with that, let's go to Ms. Carr Jones, and uh, and that I think will be our last speaker before we take a break. Uh, name and precinct, please. Elizabeth Carr Jones, precinct fourteen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to speak in support of Warren Article sixteen. First off, let me say that I love my neighbors and I really wish I could feel the same way about their landscapers. Most of us live in neighborhoods where what happens in one person's yard affects many others. And many of us want to live in neighborhoods where contractors, including landscapers, do their work with minimal disturbance. Sadly, at least for the landscapers in my neighborhood, that isn't happening. And the biggest problem is gas powered leaf blowers. I know that the current bylaw has what may seem like reasonable provisions for limiting the use of leaf blowers. However, these provisions are not universally followed, nor are the violations typically reported. This could be due to some not so obvious enforcement complications with the bylaw, the current bylaw. First, there are various reasons why people might be uncomfortable contacting the police for something like this, especially on their neighbor's contractors. Most of us have had untoward things happen with a contractor and are grateful to resolve them without police assistance. Second, it's surprisingly difficult to know when there's been a violation. There are dates, days of the week, and times of the day to remember. There are lot size thresholds that most people wouldn't have the information to calculate and noise thresholds that most people would have no way to measure. This article proposes redirecting the reporting of violations to the Board of Health, which doesn't require catching violations in real time. 
and also recognizes the effects of leaf blowers on air quality and public health. And once the gas powered leaf blowers are phased out, violations of the bylaw will be so much easier to spot. In the year 2022, I think it's fair to say that gas powered leaf blowers are noisier and more polluting than they need to be to get the work done. Phasing them out absolutely needs to happen. Article 16 is both reserved in its scope and moderate in its timeline. I thank the proponents for bringing it before town meeting and for winning the approval of the select board. Please let's get this done. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank, thank you, Ms. Carr Jones. Uh, so I just want to make one note before we head into uh, the break, which is that we located based on forensic evidence, which is to say a screenshot, uh, where Ms. Friedman was in the speaking queue. We're not sure why she dropped off, uh, but we will reinsert her based on that screenshot uh, after Ms. Hyam and before Mr. Lobel. And with that, let's take a 10 minute break now and we'll come back at uh, 940. I make it my nine. first. What's that? What was that? Uh, let's come back at 942. All right, see everyone then. Okay, and we're back. back. Um, let's, so just a, a note before we get back to the speaker queue, we have a theory that uh, when someone raises a point of order that they're getting removed from the speaker queue, that the system is just automatically doing this. Um, so we're going to try to confirm that. In the meantime, uh, we will uh, try to restore people. Uh, into this. I'll take notes on where people were, I suppose. Um, uh, let's see. And I believe this just happened to Mr. Kepline as well, presumably uh, uh, after raising a point of order. Uh, so we will try to restore that. Um, uh, and also just another quick note, um, and then we'll take speakers again. Uh, if you, there's a lot of speakers on, on this uh, speaker queue. So you know, if we're hearing the same arguments uh, repeatedly, like you know, try, try to rein your remarks in to say things that are new um, and not just reiterating. Uh, and again, we want to keep the, the scope to the keep to the scope of the noise abatement, which is the kind of context for this warrant article. Uh, but also in scope is the effectiveness or not, or um, um, the feasibility viability of a transition to electric leaf blowers from gas powered leaf leaf blowers. Um, so with that, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we did have. Um, yeah, Mr. Foscott is reminding me about announcements and resolutions. Um, so why don't we take that now? Uh, apologies for that. And uh, and then we'll get back to the speaker queue on Article uh, 16. Uh, do we have any, you can raise your hands in Zoom if you have any uh, announcements or resolutions at this point. And we'll try to keep this brief to not interrupt the uh, uh, debate on Article 16 too much. Um, let's see. I see one raised hand, but where is it? Oh, Mr. Diggins, you have your hand raised, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. And just quickly, uh, the application for town meeting, uh, I'm sorry, for town day is up, it's online. If you go to the town's website, I'm sure most of you go there like five times a day, plug in I mean, town day 2022. The first thing that pops up I mean, is the link I mean, to the town day um, web page and from that you can get to the application. So if you have a business or an organization that wants to have a booth at, at Town Day, um, that's where to fill it out. So we're making some progress towards um, having Town Day. So that's it, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so let's get back, seeing, seeing no more, see, do we have any more? Nope, that's it. And so seeing no more announcements or resolutions, let's get back to debate on Article 16 and what, we'll, uh, we'll take uh, Ms. Mandel next. Uh, name and precinct, please. Mona Mandel, Precinct 9. I'm speaking in support of Article 16 on regulations for gas powered leaf blowers. And I got the highest number of letters of support from my Precinct 9 neighbors. Um, for this article 
in this whole in the from the list of all the articles we're looking at for this town meeting. I'm choosing to highlight one of the moving and eloquent voices from one of my precinct nine senior residents who is asking for a more quiet and healthy Arlington. Due to fear of retaliation from her landlord, she has been asked, she has asked me to refer to her um, as the Mill Street land steward. And reading her own words, open coat. I live in precinct nine in one of Arlington's low income, senior disabled, handicapped, affordable housing apartment buildings. Many residents here are elderly and in poor health, and many are non-English speakers. The constant droning noise of multiple gas powered leaf blowers regularly intrudes into the building at great harm to myself and my neighbors who are elderly and vulnerable to a myriad of physical and mental health issues, which are acerbated by gas leaf blowers. I gathered over 116 signatures from residents of my building and my neighborhood in support of Article 16, many of whom did not think that they had any recourse to change this situation. You town meeting members have an opportunity at this town meeting to vote on Article 16, to further regulate or prohibit the use of internal combustion powered leaf blowers. Please vote in favor of this article to protect residents and landscape workers from the disruptive and damaging noise and highly toxic pollution created by gas powered leaf blowers which also harms the natural environment and contribute to global warming. Electric leaf blowers are now a viable alternative. They are quieter, just as powerful, and the cost the same. It's time to phase out these unnecessary and obsolete leaf blowers with regulations that will protect residents, give businesses time to adjust, and create a healthier, quieter community for everyone. For myself and those most vulnerable voiceless residents, please support Article 16 when it comes up now." End quote. Please support this article on behalf of residents who are worried about their public health and climate emergency and help to take a stand as a community of reducing our fossil fuel footprint. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you. Um, and, and again, let's try to keep this within scope. I'll, I'll allow like kind of glancing comments about things outside of the noise abatement, um, but uh, let's not dig into the uh, details of them. Thank you. Uh, let's take Ms. Hyam next. Leba Hyam. Precinct 15, I rise to move the article and all matters before it. So we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 16 and all of its amendments. Um, so do we have a second? So we have a second from Mr. Moore. Um, and let's say, so let's bring up a, uh, Motion to terminate a vote to terminate debate. This is a two thirds vote to terminate debate. Uh, if you are in favor of terminating debate uh, and then voting on the amendments, and then finally the, the main motion, uh, you want to vote yes to terminate debate. If you want to continue debate, then you want to vote no here. So we're still going to be voting in waves, the, the, the automated waves. So if you voted first last time, then you will not be first this time. If you were voted last wave last time, you will not be last this time. So please vote as soon as you can on whether to terminate debate on Article 16 
and all five amendments. If this passes, then we will proceed to, with, with, if it passes with a two thirds vote, we'll proceed uh, to, uh, to vote on articles in a particular order. And then finally, the main motion itself, uh, which may or may not be amended by those, those amendments. Um, if this vote fails and we don't reach the two thirds threshold, then we um, uh, will continue debate. And we now have 220 votes in, we're still missing 31. Um, calling out folks by name at this point was uh, not very popular with folks, so I'll, I'll refrain from doing that. Um, uh, okay, we have a number of folks who've been idle for over an hour, so um, maybe they've dropped out of the meeting, but there are just a handful of folks uh, who've been uh, uh, active recently in the portal. So um, let's give folks just another 20 seconds because we have almost all of the active voters at this point. So just another 15 seconds to get, get your votes in, please. 10 seconds. Five seconds. Okay. And let's, let's close voting on terminating debate. And so we're looking for a two thirds threshold here and we, and it passes uh, 188 uh, in the affirmative to end debate, 41 in the negative, effectively to continue debate and two abstentions. So debate is terminated. We'll just wait for these screens. And after we cycle through the precincts, we will center. Sorry, just uh, catching on some of the comments in the Q&A to see if there's any issues here. Um, okay, so now we cycle through. Let's bring up the uh, Goodwin Amendment 1. And that's what we'll vote on first. And then, so we'll, once we've opened voting, we'll bring up the text for uh, Goodwin Amendment 1, so you can see it on the screen. And we're going to be looking at the, the amendments in, in isolation one at a time. And if there's any interactions with them, we'll deal with that um, as we go. Since this is the first amendment we're going to consider, there's no conflicts uh, to worry about yet. Um, so let's see if we can show the, the text for Goodwin Amendment 1. Take a look at that. And so voting is still open. and. I'll be keeping, I have a separate window. I'm keeping an eye on uh, how many folks have uh, voted so far. So um, I'll give a warning if we're anywhere close to closing voting. So don't worry about that. So we're voting on Goodwin Amendment 1. Actually, I'm sorry, I should give a summary on this. Um, this is about the, uh, let me just bring up my summary here. Um, uh, seasonal restrictions starting uh, uh, June 15th. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, changing the uh, Goodwin Amendment 1 changes the, the seasonal restriction uh, starting uh, starting time from June 15th to May 31st and the residential transition time uh, from 2025 to 2026. Let me just go through the, yeah. You know, I'll get a little bit extra time for, for, for this amendment. It's fairly complex. Uh, so yeah, actually, yeah, now we have it up on screen here. So. So we're looking for the underscores and the strike throughs. The underscores are the added text uh, added by the amendment. The strike through is removed by this amendment relative to the main motion. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to summarize these uh, because there's a number of changes throughout. Um, 
but you can see like if, if you're in favor of these changes, uh, you want to vote yes. And, th and these changes include um, uh, uh, yeah, changing the, uh, um, sorry, changing the start date for the prohibition period uh, uh, of, the, of the calendar year from June 15th to May 31st. And then further down, you can, it's, um, right. So we're adding the trend, the commercial and municipal trend uh, transition period, adding May 31st, 2022 to March 15, 2025. Sorry, it's, it's really hard to summarize these because there's just a lot of detail in this particular amendment. The other ones will be a little easier. Um, and similarly for the resident users transition time under 3C, um, we're just kind of moving that, uh, we're changing that the year on the end date from March 15, 2025, that's getting stricken to uh, March 15, 2026. Um, okay, still a number of, uh, outstanding voters. So there's still more time to vote. Let's see. Let's see if the last one. All right, so in a nutshell, we're changing the uh, residential transition time to 2026 instead of 2025. And we're clarifying other dates uh, for the transition periods. And also changing the, uh, the start date of the prohibition period from June 15th of the calendar year to May 31st. Um, and so if you're in favor of all of those changes, uh, you want to vote yes. If you want to keep the main motion as is, as it came from the, the select board report, then you would vote no on this amendment. Okay, so we have most votes, we still have a number of votes out. Um, again, uh, I'm not going to single people out again. Um, that would uh, but let's go another uh, just 15 seconds on this. We do have most votes in at this point. Oh yeah, can we, we can go back to the voting screens now. But leaving voting open for the moment. And let's just go another, uh, another 10 seconds. Five seconds. And let's close voting on Goodwin Amendment one. Okay, and it passes 183 in the affirmative, 48 in the negative. So the main motion is now amended with Goodwin Amendment one. And we'll go through, we'll cycle through the precinct screens. And so now the next amendment that we'll take up after we've uh, seen all the voting by precinct is Goodwin Amendment 2, which will now seek to amend the main motion as amended by Goodwin Amendment 1. Okay, we're almost done here. Okay, so now we can, we'll open voting on Goodwin Amendment 2. Um, the other amendments are much simpler, so this, this should be more clear. So we'll enable voting, and then let's switch over to the text of Goodwin Amendment 2, which is simply just adding the words of an acre or more uh, in reference to the municipal properties. Uh, on which the restriction applies. Um, right, so 
right so what are we reading if so vote yes if you want to um restrict the application of this clause to the municipal municipal properties of an acre or more so that it doesn't affect uh, municipal properties that are smaller than an acre um, and if you want to leave it without a size restriction uh, or without without a size uh, criterion then you would vote no and this is about uh, whether the town can use wheeled leaf blowers powered by four-stroke engines for the purposes of clearing the Minuteman bikeway and other municipal properties. Um, if you want it to only apply to municipal properties of an acre or more, then you vote yes. If you um, don't want it to uh, uh, use the acreage as a criterion uh, for using the wheeled leaf blowers with the four stroke engines, uh, then you would vote no. So municipal properties that are less than an acre um, Yeah, municipal properties that are less than an acre would be able to use these wheeled leaf blowers, these four stroke engines, um, if you vote no. If you vote yes, then uh, the wheeled leaf blowers of the four stroke engines um, uh, cannot be used on a municipal property less than an acre. Okay, most of us, are, let's switch back now to the uh, uh, the voting portal. We're not gonna close it yet, uh, just so we can see, so folks can see whether their vote has been registered. Uh, most votes in, we have, let's see. We have fewer than 10 votes missing from folks who've been recently active in the portal. So we're getting very close. Um, Let's just go another 15 seconds, or you can also use the Q&A uh, to enter your vote if you're having trouble. Number, uh, 10 seconds. Five seconds, last chance to get your vote in. Okay, let's close voting on Goodwin Amendment 2. And this passes as well, 178 in the affirmative, 55 in the negative. And so now the main motion is amended by Goodwin Amendment 1 and Goodwin Amendment 2. And so once we're done cycling through these precinct screens, we will move on to the Friedman Amendment. This is the third of five amendments. And if you missed your screen here, uh, you can confirm your vote uh, by clicking view votes button in the left side of your portal. Okay, so let's bring up the, uh, let's open voting now for the Friedman Amendment to uh, Article 16. Oh, uh, it's actually one thing we need to do here first, I'm sorry. Um, oh, voting is open, but, um, yeah, so so now that the main motion is uh, amended by both uh, Goodwin Amendment 1 and Goodwin Amendment 2, uh, we're now considering Friedman Amendment, which, uh, yeah, which strikes the uh, March 15th to May 31st and uh, September 15th to December 30, 31st uh, uh, 
item from the transition period. So let's just take a look at this. Um, you can hold off in voting uh, and we'll explain what's going on here. Um, so the, uh, the, the red text has now been applied, which is Goodwin Amendment 1 um, is now incorporated into the main motion. Mo main motion has been, has been amended by that. Uh, so uh, actually I'll take the liberty of actually um, correcting this real time. Um, Right. So Goodwin one has already removed this. So what we're left with is that to keep the semantics and um, I don't want to make a habit of this going forward because this is very complicated, but uh, and we should really figure this out in advance when we're kind of uh, uh, putting the motions forward. Um, but since we're here, uh, and we're, we're at this point now, see these blue angle brackets here are the changes to the Friedman. So I'm gonna make an administrative change here that the Friedman Amendment to keep its same semantics requires that it strikes this portion from the main motion, which is now amended with that red text from the Goodwin One Amendment. So if you are in favor of removing this clause here, then you would want to vote yes, so that we're not restricting to those calendar dates. If you want to keep this restriction, which came from Goodwin Amendment 1, which is now incorporated into the main motion, uh, if you want to keep this, this restriction, then you will vote no on the Friedman Amendment so that, it, so that it stays in place. So again, voting yes on the Friedman Amendment will strike this clause um, so that we no longer have a uh, calendar date restriction as listed here. That's if you vote yes on the Friedman Amendment, the, that restriction will be removed. Um, if you vote no on the Friedman Amendment, which is what we're voting on now, then this clause will stay in place and this, uh, these date restrictions will continue to apply for the transition period of the gas-powered blowers operated by residents on their own property. So again, uh, I know this is confusing because the, the amendments actually uh, uh, interfere with each other. Uh, we have a couple of points of order. We still have a number of votes uh, that we're waiting for. So let's take uh, the point of order uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Weinstein. Yes, hi, uh, Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. Um, this problem was actually raised earlier uh, as a point of order, and the uh, the town meeting member was asking for clarification, and I think she saw the problem uh, that we were headed to. As I see it, uh, I don't think that this is being resolved properly because had the Friedman Amendment gone before the earlier uh, amendments. I can't remember the name uh, of the, uh, the, the, good the one, one that it's in. Yeah, the Goodwin Amendment. Um, then the Goodwin Amendment would be the one that would be, or, or the Friedman Amendment would be modified by the uh, uh, Friedman Amendment. So, uh, or the Friedman Amendment would be modified by the Goodwin Amendment or vice versa, with whichever. So the problem here is, if you have two um, amendments that are would compete with each other, or one would negate the other, then you're giving some kind of advantage to the one that is brought up last. And I think that that's a disadvantage in this case to um, 
the uh, uh, the Goodman uh, Amendment or Goodwin Amendments. So I, I, I just yeah. am very uncomfortable with the way that uh, this is being decided right now. Okay, uh, understood. Um, and yeah, I, I take your point as, as, as a point of order because right? this is about the, like the procedure here and, and whether it's uh, valid. And I guess what I would say just briefly is that uh, the ordering uh, uh, that, yeah, we, ha we have to choose a, a linear ordering of voting, right? And so whichever order we pick, uh, an argument could be made that the later applied amendments uh, are getting an unfair, or either getting an unfair advantage or they're getting uh, an unfair disadvantage in that if we leave them as is, they would leave kind of a, a logical inconsistency. And then I would have to kind of uh, clear, uh, make clear to everyone voting that the Friedman Amendment at that point, like if, if, we, if I didn't make this administrative uh, change, uh, that the Friedman Amendment is logically inconsistent with the main motion at that point. Um, and which makes it, which kind of nullifies that amendment entirely, as opposed to allowing the semantics of that amendment to actually be voted on by the meeting. And so, um, I know I'll definitely I'll, I'll study this some more after and, and kind of consult with folks afterwards to see like like, like what might have been like the kind of the best way to approach this. Uh, but but this is how I decided to go forward uh, so that the meeting can actually. Uh, exercise its will on whether to apply the semantics of the Friedman Amendment. Um, so, but I, I take your point. Uh, so we're gonna uh, continue with voting. We have most votes in at this point. Once again, if you, th this is in the context of the transition period for gas powered blowers uh, operated by residents on their own property. Uh, if you want there to be a uh, a calendar date uh, calendar date restrictions uh, which is the red text uh, on the screen here um, so you can see it highlighted here uh, if you want to keep that red text you would vote no on the Friedman amendment that's in front of us if you want to strike that calendar date those calendar date ranges uh, then you would vote yes on the Friedman Amendment. Okay, so still waiting for a number of voter, votes to come in. Let's now go back to the uh, voting screen. And so we'll leave voting open uh, for a little time longer. And okay, we just got a bunch of votes that just came in. Uh, so there's just a handful left of folks who are active in the portal who have not voted yet. Uh, so let's just give another 15 seconds to get your votes in and if you're, you can get your votes into the Q&A if you're having trouble through the portal. Just another 10 seconds. Five seconds. And let's close voting on the Friedman Amendment. Okay, so the Friedman Amendment fails. Uh, so with a vote of 45 in the affirmative, 183 in the negative, six abstentions. Uh, so the main motion at this point is amended still by uh, Goodwin Amendment 1 and Goodwin Amendment 2, but it is not amended by the Friedman Amendment. Okay, so after we're done cycling through these screens, um, We will go to the fourth of the five amendments, which is the Brown Amendment. And once again, we'll so we'll open voting on the Brown Amendment. And while voting is open, uh, we'll also bring up the uh, the text for the Brown Amendment. So voting is now open. And so let's just show it here so everyone can see what it is. And 
summary here is that um, it seeks to prohibit uh, leaf blower usage on Saturdays, not just on Sundays. Uh, so that there's parity in how the weekend days are treated as far as the restrictions. Um, so can you scroll down just a little bit? I think that, yeah, that captures the two places, right? So if you, uh, if you are in favor of um, prohibiting leaf blower usage on Saturdays, um, just as there already is for Sundays and legal holidays, if you want to prohibit leaf blower usage on Saturdays, uh, you would vote yes on the Brown Amendment that we're voting on right now. And if you don't want to prohibit usage of leaf blowers on Saturdays, which is the stat, which which is the state of the main motion as amended by the Goodwin amendments, plural. Um, then you would vote now. So if you want to keep allowing leaf blower usage on Saturdays, you'll vote no. If you want to prohibit leaf blower usage on Saturdays, you'll vote yes. And it would be treated. Uh, similarly to Sundays and legal holidays. Okay, we have a, a point of order from Mr. Gibson. Let's take that and while, while voting is still open. Uh, name and precinct, please. Hi, Chad Gibson, Precinct 4. I just wanted to note that this was commercial and municipal only on this one. Uh, just to be clear, you were, you were talking about gas, you were talking about leaf blowers in general, but this is only commercial and municipal. I thought that was important. Oh, thank, thank you for that. Th thank you for pointing that out. That, that is correct. Um, this applies only to commercial and municipal uh, transition period. Um, the residential users transition period is, is not affected. Right, so if you are just to uh, to make that clear, uh, if you are in favor of uh, prohibiting leaf blower usage on Saturdays uh, by commercial and municipal users, basically businesses and the town, effectively, um, then you'd vote yes to prohibit leaf blower usage by businesses and the town on Saturdays. Um, if you want to allow leaf blower usage on Saturdays by, by businesses and the town, uh, then you would vote no. Okay, so we have about, about a dozen uh, recently active uh, users in the portal who have not yet voted. Uh, let's try to get your votes in. Let's give folks another uh, 20 seconds. And then we'll close voting on the Brown Amendment. Yeah, thank you for going back to the screen. 15 seconds until voting closes on the Brown Amendment. 10 seconds. Last chance to get your votes in. Five seconds. And let's close voting. And the Brown Amendment passes, uh, 151 in the affirmative, 81 in the negative, and three abstentions. So the uh, main motion is now amended by the Goodwin 1 Amendment, Goodwin 2 Amendment, and the Brown Amendment. And then we have one more amendment after this to consider. Uh, so let's just cycle through screens. Okay. So that's now open voting on the Diggins Amendment.
Okay, and while voting is open, let's let's bring up the text of the Diggins Amendment. There it is. Okay, so we're adding uh, an item G under um, uh, D2, the use of gas powered leaf blowers um, and the prohibitions thereof. And item G is uh, to vote yes if you want to add this section or th this item. Uh, for the post-transition electric leaf blower regulation to make it explicit. That after, so vote yes, if, if after the uh, transition period ends, uh, that we'll have uh, these uh, allowed, um, allowed times, Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 6, and uh, Saturday, Sundays, and legal holidays, 8 to 4, where electric leaf blowers uh, are, uh, are permitted. So if you want to make this explicit in item G, uh, please vote yes. And if you want to leave it out, then you'd vote no. We have a, a point of order by uh, Mr. Let's start with Ms. Vip 3. Let's start with Mr. Rosenthal. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. <clears throat> when you first, uh, earlier on, when you first mentioned the Diggins Amendment, you summarized it as basically filling a, uh, or making explicit something that you thought had been implicit. But during the break, I went through the uh, main motion and all the articles and made up a table of what times would be allowed for what and understand that we're talking only about electric leaf blowers here. Um, and what I found was that the main motion plus the two Goodwin amendments plus the Brown amendment would mean that the, uh, the transition or during the transition Electric, electric blowers are not allowed during the two Sabbaths, Saturdays and Sundays. Um, you know, based on what you earlier said, one would assume that this is just intended to fill in the hole uh, that was you know, unaddressed um, in the main motion uh, by saying this will also take, you know, the same rules will apply uh, after the transition is over. But what I found is that what it actually says is that um, under the Diggins Amendment, electric leaf blowers are allowed, not, not, not disallowed, but they are allowed uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. So that's a rather major change. Right. So yeah, just to be clear, yeah, so uh, at least what I intended when I said to make it explicit is, is not to imply that um, the same effect was implicitly covered by the rest of it, but to make explicit what actually happens uh, and that to figure out what happens in the absence of this, uh, like the Diggins Amendment requires the exercise that, that you had gone through. Uh, so uh, uh, I didn't mean to imply that the semantics are the same, it's just explicit versus implicit, and apologies if, if that's what was conveyed, um, but that it's okay. making it explicit as opposed to leaving it implicit to what the other uh, previous clauses kind of add up to. In any case, I think it's important that the uh, town meeting members voting on this are very clear that, uh, you know, exactly what this does and that this is a change from- Sure, but Mr. Rosenthal, but also, yeah. So this is kind of venturing outside of the territory. It, it's useful what you're saying, but it's venturing outside of the territory of a point of order. Um, and so the, the plain text is here uh, in front of folks uh, uh, for them to, to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another point of order from uh, Sigmus Bloom next. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. You may have already answered this and I may be incorrect, but I'm just trying to be clear. Um, the, uh, Mr. the previous speaker spoke about the fact that we had just voted 
to disallow um, Saturdays as well as Sundays and legal holidays. And that was just for gas, gas and this is for electric. Is that the difference? Am I, I'm just trying to clarify. Sure, sure. Um... And so that's a valid point of order to ask, like, what is it that we're actually voting on here, right? Especially in the context of all these amendments, it, it can be confusing. Um, um, so the main motion that uh, this vote is seeking to amend or not, that it's, we're looking, it's relative to the main motion as amended by Goodwin Amendment 1, Goodwin Amendment 2, and the Brown Amendment. And so is your question specifically about given the um, Given the uh, um, the changes due to the Brown Amendment, how does that affect this? That's my question. Yes, right. that's my question. Yeah. Um, so with the Brown Amendment, that covers the commercial municipal users transition periods only. And let's see. And then here in the Diggins Amendment, talking about post-transition electric leaf blower regulation, um, it does not let's say does not specify uh, whether it's like specific. It's not specific to commercial or municipal uh, or residential. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Heim, do you, do you have an answer for for Ms. Bloom? Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, Doug Heim, Town Council. So the purpose of uh, Mr. Uh, Brown's amendment, Jacoby Brown's amendment, was to treat um, the transition period the same on Saturdays and Sundays for reasons that are that go back to the original passage of the leaf blower bylaws with respect to certain commercial and municipal users. The Sundays were uh, Sundays were always Saturdays were treated differently than Sundays with respect to commercial and municipal leaf blower uses. Um, the way that Mr. Diggins amendment reads, it puts basically all users on equal footing after the transition period. So the same rules apply for everybody on a list of electric leaf blowers after the transition period's over. Mr. Jacoby Brown's um, amendment and objection to my understanding to the scheme that was sort of put in front of town meeting before his amendment was that he didn't think that during the transition period, um, Sundays ought to be afforded a different status than Saturdays. So his amendment was very tight in scope uh, and uh, it was trying to address a very specific issue to my understanding. Mr. Diggins uh, is also saying that Saturdays and Sundays ought to be treated equally but after the transition period is over in a way that everybody can use electric leaf blowers. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have uh, another point of order by uh, Mr. Oster. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my point of order, and I'm-, I'm uh, name, name and precinct? Sorry, uh, Adam Oster, precinct three. Um, I'm gonna- uh, this is a, a question, and I hope that uh, uh, you'll be able to find the right person to answer it. But my understanding of this issue of what is changing and what is not changing is that uh, the Diggins Amendment doesn't actually change anything. It just makes it clearer because you have to refer to the existing bylaw as it stands today, where there is this set of when you can use a leaf blower requirements and they are the same i think someone please correct me if i'm wrong as the one that mr diggins is proposing that we codify in this section um you can't just look at all of these amendments and try to figure out what's going on you have to actually look at the bylaw is that right yeah so, so yeah given the the complexity and nuance of of this amendment being applied to the amended main motion. And then all of that's relative to the bylaws that are being amended by all of this, um, which like, this is not technically a point of order, but I think it is a very important point because it, it is kind of the nature of what we're voting on. And there is a lot of confusion and complexity to this. So Mr. Mr. Heim, uh, can, you an can you answer Mr. Oster's question? As what, to, like, I, like, what is the change relative to the bylaws that are being amended by all of this? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And uh, thank you, Mr. Oster. 
that is, uh, I, I want to be to be tight with Tammy each time. That is more or less correct. Uh, there's a little bit of room for interpretation the way the bylaw currently reads because the bylaw was written at a time before there were a lot of electric leaf blowers on the market. Uh, so Mr. Diggins' amendment, I would say, is consistent with the bylaw and the way that you're interpreting it, but it kind of eliminates all ambiguity and doubt about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we have one more point of order. Um, we still have a number of missing votes uh, who maybe are just kind of hanging, hanging, hanging back, waiting uh, to see uh, how um, how these answers and questions, or the questions and answers kind of uh, shake out. Let's take uh, Ms. Zhu next. Um, uh, hi, Nathan, precinct, Emily Zhu, Precinct 1. Um, I'll be very quick just in case this is not actually a point of order, but I think that Mr. Diggins' amendment has the unintended effect of allowing commercial use on weekends, which was not previously allowed. Um, and I don't think that was the intention of the amendment, but I think every, but I think that is the actual effect. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, that, that's, yeah, like I said, that, that's really uh, not a point of order, but um, I think people have the plain text in front of them uh, to compare. And okay, so, sorry. Because, unfortunately, because debate is closed, um, uh, yeah, I, I think we just need to leave. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Heim, if, if you have one brief, uh, uh, clarification to make about that, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Jermaine, to Mr. Oster's point, if you looked at section three daytime only activities, the bylaw, it would talk about essentially daytime only activities between uh, certain hours, including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. It didn't necessarily make a distinction between commercial and residential, but for this very distinct issue of leaf blowers. And again, Mr. Uh, Brown's amendment is to try to address uh, an, an iniquity in the, and it already has, iniquity in the way that the transition period was treated. Uh, whether or not that could have been done differently from, from the get-go is, 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 is not really what is before you, uh, but this is not a radical departure from uh, the rules as Mr. Ostra sort of outlined there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's see, we still have about uh, a couple dozen missing uh, votes from folks who have been active relatively recently. So uh, please get your votes in. Uh, can we go back to the uh, the voting screen, please? So people can see whether their votes been registered or not. Um, okay. So we have most folks in at this point. Uh, let's just go another uh, 15 seconds. Um, last chance to vote. You can vote in the Q and A. Uh, 10 seconds. Five seconds, last chance to vote. And let's close voting now on the Diggins Amendment. And Diggins am uh, Amendment passes with uh, 169 votes in the affirmative, 62 in the negative, three abstentions. Uh, so we now have the main motion uh, um, as amended by the Goodwin 1 uh, Amendment, Goodwin 2 Amendment, the Brown Amendment, and the Diggins Amendment. Okay, so we'll just cycle through the screens here. And after this, we'll vote on the main motion as amended. Okay, so let's uh, open Article 16 for voting. And this is the main amendment, uh, the, the main motion uh, of Article 16 as amended by Goodwin Amendment 1, Goodwin Amendment 2, the Brown Amendment, and the Diggins Amendment. So, and while that vote is open, I will just uh, quickly edit the doc with the kind of combined changes in it um, to leave only the amendments that have passed. 
And you can take a look at that. Okay, that should be everything. Okay, can we bring up the uh, the unified view of all the amendments superimposed. Okay, so all I've done here, I, I've removed the changes from that were proposed by the Friedman Amendment. So we're seeing just the amendments applied um, uh, that passed, which are the Goodwin Amendment One, Good Goodwin Amendment Two, the Brown Amendment, and the Diggins Amendment. So you can see all of that in context. The red is Goodwin one, which has been applied uh, um, to the main motion. Uh, the orange is uh, the Brown Amendment, which has been applied to the main motion as well. And if you keep scrolling down, there's more from the, the orange from the Brown Amendment. And then there's the green of an acre or more in I believe two uh, B I, which uh, is from Goodwin Amendment two, and then we have more changes in red from Goodwin Amendment one, and then if we scroll down a bit more, we'll see the purple from the Diggins Amendment. So we have 211 votes in. We're still missing about 40. Um, we're missing about maybe 25 or so from folks who've been active in just the last couple of minutes. Uh, so uh, let's go back now to the uh, voting screen. So we're voting on the main motion for Article 16 as amended by the Goodwin Amendment 1, Goodwin Amendment 2, the Brown Amendment and the Diggins Amendment. Okay, we're still missing uh, about 20 folks. Okay. Let's just go another, uh, let's go another 20 seconds and you're voting to the Q&A if, you, if you're unable to vote uh, in the voting portal. You can also call it in to Ms. Brazil. Uh, see another 10 seconds. Five seconds. Okay, let's close voting on the main motion. And the motion passes. So, uh, the main motion, as amended by those four uh, amendments, passes uh, 187 in the affirmative, uh, 44 in the negative. And we'll just cycle through the screens. Okay, so let's bring now bring up uh, Article 17. And this is from the select board report. So, uh, so let's bring up um, Mr. Diggins, uh, chair of the select board. Uh, uh, Mr. Diggins, do you have anything uh, uh, to speak to about the, uh, the vote from the uh, select board on this article? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I do, I had actually put it away in light of what I thought was coming up um, later. So let me um, scroll back and get it. I'm sorry about this, you know, 
So I'm not going to wing it like I did Article 6. So um, just a second. You want to blow up the text a little bit. Sorry. OK, so the select board voted 5-0 to remove the prohibition on self-service gas stations. Often Arlington is a leader in the Commonwealth, but this is one case where we are on the trailing edge, and that's okay. The select board appreciates that gas station owners are finding it difficult to hire employees, and we want to provide the ability for gas station owners to allow self-service pumping or to remain full service only. As we note in our report, concerns about safety, an increase in the number of pumps, and the guarantee of service for those with mobility challenges have been fully addressed. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Great, thank you. So let's um, uh, let's say let's. I know um, uh, Mr. Reblack uh, was going to introduce a proponent uh, of this. Uh, so let's bring up Mr. Reblack. Hello, Mr. Moderator. This is Steve Reblack from Precinct One. And yes, although I did had intended to introduce the proponent and uh, another individual who is going to make a presentation on the proponent's behalf, I discovered um, very shortly ago that the individual who would have been making the presentation um, had a medical emergency and needed to go to the hospital. I do not know the nature of um, this emergency and I, I do hope the individual is okay. Uh, but given the circumstances, Mr. Moderator, I would ask if we could lay Article 17 on the table. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, so we have a motion to lay Article 17 on the table. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Mr. Moore in the portal. Um, and so let's actually, uh, let's take a, a, a full, so we need, for, for laying this on the table, we need a, uh, this is not debatable, and we need a two-thirds vote. Normally, when we do this for Article 3, um, we just do raise hands. In this case, uh, because uh, uh, like this is not like a, you know, a, a as automatic a sort of thing as Article Three is for receiving reports, uh, let's actually uh, take a, a vote on this. Uh, so, can we bring that up in the in the portal for laying on the table? Yeah. Uh, it says it's a majority vote, but um, uh, the book says um, I think time meeting time says it's a two thirds vote. Um, uh, what can we do about that? Uh, yeah, is it how, how quickly can we make a new one that's a two thirds vote for laying it on the table? Can we do have a point of order from um, actually uh, from Mr. Wagner? When, when we before we uh, enable voting on this, let, let's just take that point of order in case that's relevant. Um, are we able to do that? Like maybe on another uh, another tab, maybe or or. Um, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, name yes, me. thanks. Carl Wagner, uh, Precinct 15. Sorry, I have COVID, so my voice is a bit crappy. Um, point of order here. Um, I think, Mr. Moderator, you have at least two former moderators on the call who could probably advise you what they did, which might help solve the problem of whether this is two-thirds or majority vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So, Well, I'm comfortable just going by the book, um, but... Um, I think let's take uh, Ms. Heim next. Point of order. Leva Heim, Precinct 15. I was just going to recommend that we start voting and you and town council work it out while we're voting so that the two can happen simultaneously. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, we might do that because I mean, we could look at the, the numbers and you know, if, if the quantum of vote changes, but I'm comfortable going with the two thirds. And uh, let's take uh, uh, Ms. Howard's uh, I, I 
it looks like that point of order has been rescinded. Um, so we've, I believe we've cleared all the point of orders effectively at this point. Uh, we have another point of order from uh, Mr. Zimmer. Let's take that one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, name and precinct, please. This is Ethan Zimmer, Precinct 4. Can you tell us whether we are laying on the table till a time certain or indefinitely? Um, well, so laying on the table is um, indeterminate. It, it, it's, it's laid on the table until it's uh, taken from the table. Uh, there's a separate uh, motion that can be made to um, uh, postpone to a time certain. Um, and I think if we, let's take Mr. Foskett's point of order, because I think it'll be related to this. Um, Mr. Foskett? Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Uh, I think if the proponent made a motion to postpone by a week or 10 days or something like that, it would be a simple majority vote. That is correct. That is the trade-off effectively between um, postponing to a date certain, be a majority vote, but you have to pick a particular date. Um, uh, whereas if you lay it on the table, it's indeterminate until basically it, uh, it gets removed from the table at a later point, um, but it's a higher bar with a two-thirds vote. Um, so you kind of, you pay for the um, flexibility of being able to pull it off the table at any point by uh, having a higher uh, threshold with the quantum of vote. Um, did Mr. Heim have his hand up? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I don't think that there's a question in your mind about the quantum of vote. I think that you're trying to get the platform to recognize the two thirds vote, correct? That's correct. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you. Yep, that, that's right. Yeah, I'm not questioning what the quantum of vote. I'm confident the quantum of vote should be two thirds uh, for laying it on the table. Um, and since that is what Mr. Rubelak, uh, I appreciate the suggestion, uh, Mr. Fosco, since Mr. Rubelak has already moved uh, to lay it on the table, we're, uh, we're gonna, and we have a second on that, we're gonna proceed with that now. So, all right, so apologies for the, we're kind of um, in uh, unconventional procedural space, uh, but you know, Going by the book, uh, we're going to move forward with a two thirds vote on laying Article 17 uh, on the table. So we could take this up another time since the speaker, the uh, proponent who is going to speak, uh, is currently uh, in the hospital. So if you are in favor of uh, delaying Article 17 uh, until a later date where we'll pull it off this kind of temporary holding place that we call the table, um, uh, vote yes. Uh, if you want to debate uh, Article 17 in the remaining uh, 11 minutes and 10 seconds of the meeting tonight, uh, you can vote now. And then we'll start debate uh, immediately on Article 17 if you vote now. I mean, if, um, uh, if more than one third of the body votes now, it's a two thirds vote, it takes two thirds uh, in the affirmative to uh, lay Article 17 on the table so that we can take it up another time. So we have uh, just over 200 votes now. Um, the wave voting uh, should still be in effect. So if let's try to get your votes in. Um, still missing about uh, 30 votes, but only, only a handful of those are from folks who've been recently active in the portal. So let's just go another uh, 10 seconds and then we'll close voting on whether to lay article 17 on the table to take it up another time, five seconds. This is a two thirds vote in order to lay it on the table. 
Let's close voting. Okay, and it passes. Uh, 192 in the affirmative, 25 in the negative, five uh, extent, uh, abstentions, um, so 88.5%. So we're well above the two-thirds threshold. We'll just cycle through those. So Article 17 is now on the table, which means we could take it up uh, at any time in the future uh, by um, a motion uh, to take Article 17 from the table, um, which itself is a majority vote. Two thirds to get it onto the table one, uh, and a majority vote to take it off. Usually we don't run into that with uh, Article 3 for receiving reports because it's usually a unanimous vote. Right. Either way, take putting it on or taking it off. Um, it's not common that we do this for other articles. So. Okay, it is, uh, is um, 10.51, uh, and so we're gonna go into uh, article, we've already done article 18, so we're gonna go to article uh, 19, which I believe we have a substitute motion for. So let's first go to, um, let me just bring up my screen here. So we're now on article 19. Um, this is, uh, this, uh, uh, the street name uh, Magliozzi uh, Boulevard, or is it Magliozzi Boulevard? I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Um, but let's uh, let's bring up um, uh, Mr. Diggins, select board chair, to speak uh, to speak to the vote uh, on this article. It's a no action article. So uh, can you speak to uh, the select board's vote on this article? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So first, permit me to start with admitting the obvious. I'm no Senator Kerry, but in his words, I was for this article before I was against it. Literally, when I changed my vote, the select board's recommendation changed from favorable action to no action. Now, I've never owned a car, but I've enjoyed listening to many hours of car talk while sorting fruit flies. So, of course, when this idea came up, it initially appealed to me. But in the course of the deliberation, it became clear to me that we have a process in place that could lead to the same outcome that Mr. Slickman proposes, but it's a process that also respects that the naming of streets is within the purview of the select board. Effectively, this article carries the weight of a non-binding resolution. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And let's bring up um, uh, Mr. Schlickman, who I believe has a substitute motion. Um, if Mr. Slickman is, if you had yourself to speaking to you, we could actually bring you up, but, uh, or you can just go ahead. Um, name and precinct, please. Uh, Paul Schlickman, precinct nine. You're muted. Am I muted? Yeah. I, I, I hear you. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk procedurally first and then to, uh, to the heart of the article. First of all, let me move uh, 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 substituting. Uh, I'm moving my substitute motion. Okay. Um, do we have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a second from Mr. Hyam. Um, so, Mr. Slickman, did, did you want to uh, speak to your substitute motion at this point, or should, should we just jump into the speaking queue? Um, it's uh, 1055, so I don't. I would prefer to adjourn and come back first thing uh, after the special. Okay. Do you have? Do you, are you proposing a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Do we have a second on Mr. Schlickman's motion to adjourn at 1054? Uh, we have a second from Mr. Uh, Weinstein. Um, uh, but before we vote, actually, we let me ask, do we have uh, uh, any notices of reconsideration from anything? Uh, if you were on the prevailing side of an article tonight, any, do you want to give notice uh, for reconsideration? Uh, I see we have, uh, let's see, Mr. Oster? Uh, yes, on Article 16. On Article 16, okay. We have any other, uh, uh, let's see, then... Madam Clerk, please take that note. And uh, do we have any other notices of reconsideration for tonight? Um, Mr. Moderator? Yes, Mr. Foskett? Yes, I'd like to move. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. I'd like to move reconsideration of Article 55. 55? Okay. 55. Having, having voted on the 
Oh, on the, you voted on the prevailing side. Uh, presumably, yes, Mr. Officer, I mean, we can verify Mr. Officer voted on the prevailing side of 16. Um, do we, and um, do we have any other uh, notices of reconsideration? Um, I see, I see, Mr. Slickman, you have your hand raised. Yes, I'd like to file notice of reconsideration on 16. I'd like clarification. Did Mr. Foskis, Foskett move uh, reconsideration or file notice? I believe he uh, moved notice of reconsideration. He said he, he moved. I'm, the I'm word... sorry, I, I, Mr. Schlickman is correct, sir. I, I said move. Re I meant to say uh, file notice of reconsideration. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I I translated what you said into what I thought you meant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schlickman, for actually uh, catching what Mr. Foskett actually asked. Um, so 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 far we have notices of notices of reconsider not moving reconsideration but notices of reconsideration for articles 16 and articles uh, article 55 uh, Mr. Oster moved notice of reconsideration for article 16 and Mr. Foskett moved note or yeah, moved notice of reconsideration for article 55 do we have any other notices of reconsideration uh, I don't think it's possible because I think those are the only two articles that we actually Yes, uh, Mr. Moderator, I also moved reconsideration on 16. Okay, so, so Mr. Slickman as well. Uh, and we have a point of order from Mr. Jalka. Uh, name and precinct and point of order, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Daniel Jalka, precinct six. Uh, having voted in favor of Article 16, I file notice of reconsideration. Okay, so noted. So we have uh, Mr. Jalkut is uh, um, moving notice of reconsideration on Article 16. Um, and I'll just say I only use the point of order because the um, raise hand feature doesn't seem to be enabled on my Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, seeing no other um let's see. uh seeing no other notices of reconsideration tonight we'll go back to we have we had a second uh, we, we had a motion by mr schlickman to adjourn we had a second of that motion by mr weinstein uh please uh, use raise hands in zoom if you have any objections to adjourning uh, adjourning it's uh 10 58 p.m um i see a couple of Objections to adjourning. Um, I see three. I see four. Um, we still uh, that is not enough um, to stop the adjournment. So uh, it's a majority vote to adjourn, uh, and so we will reconvene on Wednesday, May eleventh. Uh, at which point we will take up the uh, the special town meeting, which is uh, six articles. I believe it's five that we actually vote on. Uh, and so we'll we'll do our best to try to finish uh, the uh, special town meeting uh, on Wednesday, if possible, and then we can get into budgets after that as well. All right. Uh, see everyone Wednesday night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>